Hello all you crazy people out there, my name is Michael, I like wizards and dragons and making games, and welcome back to making games. 3D games and Game Maker tend to be rather notoriously slow. A while ago I was making some videos on optimization strategies that you can use in 3D, but I haven't actually done one in a while because I've been distracted by other things. So if you haven't seen the earlier 3D optimization videos that I've done, it's probably not a bad idea to do that. In the past, I've mostly talked about different things that you can do on the GML side to speed things up, as well as a couple different settings that you can use that you may find helpful. But I haven't actually talked very much about the shaders themselves yet, and if you were to think that the code that actually runs to actually put the pixels on the screen would be a big part of how well your game performs, then you would be correct. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. So I have this demo running on the Raspberry Pi. It's not doing very well, as you can see. We're hovering around 6 to 7 frames per second. Um, if you can't actually see it very well, I've made a few changes to this uh, to this demo program, and I, I guess I'll just run the game on Windows so that you can see it a little bit better. Um, let's see, let's wait for this to uh, to start. And I've um, I've made a few changes. I have switched out uh, the, the design of the trees, so I am no longer using the the um, the planar trees, the planar uh, 2D tree sprites. I am now actually using a um, an actual 3D model of a tree. Uh, mostly because I was just getting tired of looking at the planar tree sprites for so many videos, but also partially because these have a um, uh, these guys have some uh, more polygons that are facing in more different directions that should interact with the lighting in somewhat more interesting ways. Um, if you are uh, if you are interested in these trees your, uh, yourselves, by the way, um, uh, where I got them from is uh, this. I did not make these myself. Uh, where I got them from is this uh, user on itch.io called Broken Vector Graphics. And they've got a bunch of uh, decent looking low poly 3D objects that you can that you can use. Some of them are free, some of them are not free. Uh, you can look through this yourself. I will have a link to this in the, in the video description if you're interested. Anyway, uh, what else there is is also um, a couple uh, a couple spotlights. So there's a couple red spotlights, a couple white spotlights. Um, there are 16 of them. You can find them at random positions throughout the uh, throughout this little test level. Each of the trees are combined into a single vertex buffer, as per one of the previous videos. And um, in the um, the shader is fairly simple. Uh, in the fragment shader, we are evaluating uh, each of the 16 spotlights. This is all basically the same as the spotlight video that I made last summer, except the only difference is that instead of passing a single position, color, and range uh, to the shader via a uniform, uh, we are now passing 16 positions, colors, and ranges to the shader via a, uh, an array of uniforms, or a uniform array, rather. And... Um, Instead of just evaluating a single one, we are now looping through and updating the light color uh, for each light on each fragment. Okay, um, the, uh, the vertex shader is basically, uh, it's not quite a pass-through vertex shader, but it's pretty close. We're just setting the position, we're setting the uh, world normal and the world position that we're passing to the fragment shader by a varying, and the, uh, the other varyings for ver uh, vertex color and texture coordinate are just, um, they're just being uh, assigned to the, to the attributes as is. So in this video, I am going to be talking about a couple major things that have to do with the way that shaders work that you may or may not be able to do to speed up your 3D games and Game Maker. Um, I am not going to be talking about what I'll call micro-optimizations, which might be things such as instead of um, instead of saying in position dot, uh, x in position dot y in position dot z, uh, instead just passing the in position to the vector4 constructor uh, followed by a 1. Uh, this theoretically is faster. In practice, you're probably not going to see very much of a difference. Doing the same thing down here, a couple lines down, when we're figuring out the world position, uh, again, you theoretically, if you were to recycle this value instead of allocating another vector 4, it would be slightly faster. In practice, I highly doubt you're going to see very much of a difference at all. Things like, is it faster to multiply by 0 0.5 or divide by 2.0? I'm not going to worry about it. The answer, by the way, is the former. Uh, those are micro-optimizations. I'm not really going to be concerned very much by those. Instead, I'm going to be talking about things that you could potentially do to uh, cut out large amounts of processing that your shaders have to do. I think everything that I want to bring up in this video is something that may or may not actually be, be feasible in your game. Uh, things such as, for example, we have 16 lights that we're evaluating in this shader. And shaders are pretty fast generally, GPUs are generally pretty good at doing things like this, but if you do have a ton of lights that you're evaluating in your scene, uh, and if you were to think that maybe cutting down a couple of them would would speed up your uh, would give you a couple extra frames per second, uh, you would be correct. I have two uh, I have two macros for light count. One is this define inside the um, inside the fragment shader itself, which is just uh, telling the shader how many lights that it has. And one is inside uh, 
the object camera create event telling GML how many lights we have and how many how many uh, light how many pieces of light data we need to send to the shader. And if I were to cut this down from 16 to, for example, two, um, we are going to see once once I run the game again on the Raspberry Pi because this is not the Raspberry Pi. Uh, one, we're not going to have nearly as many lights in the world, and it's going to be a lot darker because the um, when I when I tend to record my screen, it tends to reduce the gamma by quite a bit, and it's going to be a lot. It's going to be rather dark. But we have two uh, we have two spotlights, one red and one white. If I were to run this again on the Raspberry Pi as intended the first time. Boy, this is dark. Anyway, I'm standing in the same place I was when I started the video, and instead of getting 6 to 7 frames per second, we are getting, we are pushing 20. Uh, 19 to 21, it looks like it's oscillating between. So, we've tripled the frame rate by cutting down the number of, uh, of lights in the scene from, what was it, 16 down to 2? Um, if you want to actually be able to see, because again, it's rather dark in here. I guess I could increase the ambient color a little bit, but if I come over to the, uh, to the white spotlight, you know what, I'll just, instead of making one spotlight red, some spotlight red, and some spotlights uh, white, I'll just make them all white, and that'll at least... The white lights are at least brighter than the, um, the red lights. So the obvious downside of this is that while we do triple our frame rate, at least in this particular case, uh, we do not have nearly as many lights available to us. And if the style of your game is heavy on effects such as this, uh, you may care about that. Otherwise, if you think you can get away with not having as many lights on the screen active at once, you should definitely consider doing it. If you have a bunch of, for example, things like streetlights or torches in your level, but only a couple of them are ever going to be on screen at once, you should definitely consider only, um, only having the three or four or whatever lights active in your scene at once, however many it happens to be. I should also probably point out that down here, at least the way that I usually do lights in games, um, even if you have 16 lights uh, being used, being defined in your shader, but you're only using, for example, two or three of them, uh, the shader will still process all 16 lights, even the ones that are turned off, which is obviously a bit of a waste. This may or may not actually be the case, depending on the way that you've written your lighting shader to accommodate for multiple lights, but in the back of your mind, that might just be something to bear in mind. In this particular shader, if I've disabled a light by, like, setting its color to black and its range to zero, uh, then we're still going to be doing this math just with a, a color that is black and a range that is zero. Unless I actually modify the light count value, uh, we're not going to be actually saving any time like that. So something else that I should probably bring up, because this tends to be a bit of a point of contention, uh, if statements and shaders. I've been saying for the entire, pretty much the entire last year plus not to worry about them. If you have a ton of if statements in your shader, yes, they can impact performance, but they're generally not the first thing that I look to when my game starts to run slow. Additionally, things like loops, traditionally things like this would contain an if statement because you are starting a, a variable at zero, you are incrementing it, and if the variable is is less than, is greater than or equal to light count, then we're going to stop, and that would be an if statement, but uh, the shader compiler, in this case, will be smart enough to know that this loop will always and only ever run run twice, or run 16 times, or whatever, run whatever the light count is set to because this is a compile time macro and the uh, the shader compiler can figure out that i equals zero i is less than two i plus plus is only ever going to run twice and when you compile your shader code it will do what is known as unroll this loop so the uh, the for loop just kind of goes away something else you may consider doing and this is something else that may or may not actually affect the way that your game looks is instead of running this sledding calculation in the fragment shader you may instead wish to run this lighting calculation in the vertex shader uh, over here, I've written a separate version of the shader to do this lighting calculation in the vertex shader instead of the fragment shader. Uh, so we now have basically a pass-through fragment shader, and uh, in the vertex shader we have some extra code which is going to edit the uh, the vertex color based on the lighting circumstances. It's very much the same math. Uh, I've also set the I've also defined the light count to 16 up here, so I guess I'll just bump that down to two to make it consistent. And if we were to instead draw the scene with the vertex shader, uh, with the lights being calculated in the vertex shader. Uh, let me just set this value, the shader that we're using, the uniform constants that we're setting uh, to the vertex shader version. And if I were to run the game now, uh, we would see that we will have an additional um, boost to our, our frame rate. Uh, let me, um, I want to say we're going to be going from about 20 to maybe about 30, low 30s. And I said I was going to set the uh, I was I said I was going to set the vertex uh, the light color to to white instead of um, instead of red because that just makes it easier to see. I probably should have thought 
about that a little bit ahead of time before doing this video. Okay, so the light color is always going to be white. Let's try that again. Okay, so here we are. I'm standing in the same corner of the forest that I was standing in in the other tests. And we are seeing not quite 30, but high 20s, 25, 26, 27 frames per second, which is, again, ooh, we just got a boost out of nowhere. Um, which is a, uh, an improvement over what we were seeing before, low 20s. And the reason for this has to do with the sequence of events that happens between when you say vertex submit and when you actually see something on the screen. So when you draw something on the computer in, uh, in 2D or in 3D, uh, when you say vertex submit, uh, for example, down here, where is it? Here, the uh, the tree vertex buffer. Uh, what happens first is you go to the vertex shader, and there are other stages that happen uh, during the graphics pipeline, but they're generally more or less invisible to game makers, so I won't really be uh, describing them here. For each vertex in the vertex shader, you go to the vertex buffer, and the end job of the vertex buffer, regardless of anything else that you might be doing in here, in this, uh, in, this, in this vertex shader, is to figure out a value that you want to put into gl underscore position. And gl underscore position represents the position of each vertex on the screen. So if your camera is looking directly at whatever you're drawing, it's probably going to be somewhere close to the middle of the screen. If you are looking off to the side a little bit, uh, the vertex that you're drawing may end up on the, on the side of the screen or in the corner of the screen. And you can do a bunch of other stuff like setting the values of varyings, which you pass to the fragment shader, but that's all really secondary. The main goal of the vertex shader is to figure out where each vertex lives on the screen. And this happens exactly once for every vertex that you try to draw. So I, I want to say there are about 470,000 vertices in the, um, in the forest, which means that for all 470,000 of those vertices, this code in the vertex shader, or this code in the vertex shader, or which, whichever one's active right now, I think I'm using this shader right now, uh, this code is going to run 470,000 times every single frame of the game. After that's finished, for each triangle that's formed, a triangle being formed from three vertices, the GPU is going to do what is known as rasterizing the image. Rasterizing is something that might sound familiar if you've ever used something like Photoshop before. During this step, we're going to rasterize each triangle, which means we're going to turn each triangle, which can be thought of a vector object defined by mathematical points in space, to a raster image, which is just the fancy word for a grid of pixels. And those are going to be the pixels that each triangle occupies on the screen. Now, this is where the amount of work that the GPU has to do to draw each frame starts to get a little bit complicated, because each triangle may or may not actually resolve to the same number of pixels. If you have a very large triangle, or a triangle that's very close to the camera, which takes up a lot of space on the screen, uh, that triangle could easily turn into thousands, or tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands of individual pixels that need to be filled and shaded. Whereas if you have a very small triangle, if you ha or if you have a triangle that's very far away from your perspective camera, then it may only turn into a couple of fragments. Or in some cases, if the triangle is behind the camera, or if it's off the sides of the screen, or at least partially off the sides of the screen, uh, or if it's closer than the near clipping plane, or farther than the far clipping plane, then it may not turn into any triangles. On a related note, this is also the stage where if a fragment that is, um, if a pixel that is part of a triangle is not on the screen for any reason, so if it's, uh, if it's off the screen, or if it's too far away, or if it's too close, or if it's behind you, or if you have uh, back face culling turned on and the fragment is facing away from you, if the triangle is facing away from, you, from the camera. This is also the stage where all those fragments will be removed, and the fragment shader just won't have to deal with them. Anyway, the end result of all this is that the number of vertices that you have to draw using the vertex shader tends to be pretty constant, whereas the number of fragments that you have to draw using the fragment shader can vary wildly. Although with that said, when you're using 3D in Game Maker, you tend to not be drawing that many vertices in one frame. You're not doing anything like Unreal Engine 5, so you're not going to be drawing like millions and millions of, of vertices every single frame. Um, the number of vertices that you that you draw tends to be lower than the number of fragments that you draw. And that's why that in this example at least, uh, doing the lighting calculations in the vertex shader does give you a slight uh, boost to the frame rate over doing the lighting calculations in the fragment shader because we have fewer vertices to draw. Um, we are running this code fewer times in here than we are in the fragment shader. Um, if you've ever heard anybody make the claim that code is faster in the vertex shader uh, compared to the fragment shader, uh, that's generally what they really mean. It's not that the fragment shader is inherently slower than the vertex shader, it's just that the fragment shader usually has to run many more times than the vertex shader does. It's not a hard and fast rule, it just tends to happen. And all this kind of goes out the window when you start talking about deferred rendering. Pretty much everything I've talked about in a, in a YouTube video so far, except for like the, uh, the outlines video, has been with regards to uh, what is known as forward rendering. Forward rendering is what we're doing now. Uh, forward rendering is when you when you deal with all the lights and the fog and everything else all in one shot. 
Uh, deferred rendering is a little bit different. Deferred rendering, you would essentially apply the different effects in stages, uh, but that is that is most certainly a story for another day. Anyway, another implication of this is that you probably at some point heard a certain joke that's as far as I know as old as computer graphics itself, and um, it has a similar ring to the if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's around, does it make a sound uh, thought experiment? Which I always thought was a bit of a silly question, but to each their own. And that is that if something is, um, if something is not in view of the camera, does it actually exist? As far as the computer is concerned. And based on everything that I've just said, you probably already got a pretty good idea of what the answer to that is. Uh, the answer is, somewhat unhelpfully, uh, yes and no. The vertex shader, as established, will run once for every vertex in the scene, and uh, it will run even if the vertices are not on the screen. Uh, as sort of established, the vertex shader is what is responsible for figuring out if a vertex is on the screen in the first place, because that's the whole point of the gl underscore position value. Whereas when you get to the fragment shader, if a pixel is not on the screen, then it will not, then the fragment shader will not run on it. If something's out of your field of view, or if it's too far away, or if it's behind you, then the fragment shader will not run on that fragment. And if something's behind the camera, as far as the fragment shader is concerned, it may as well not exist. Now, obviously, unless you actually, like, completely eject the vertex buffer or whatever other information uh, from the computer's memory, a tree that's behind the camera will obviously still be in your computer's memory, and it'll probably still be updating and uh, responding to collision and stuff like that. But graphics-wise, in the fragment shader, if you, can't see a, uh, if you can't see a pixel, it may as well not exist. So that leads us to another little experiment that I can do. And this isn't really going to really affect any changes that I'm going to uh, going to be making to the shader code, but at the very least, this should hopefully give you some ideas about what tends to be expensive to, to draw um, when you're drawing stuff in a game and what tends to not be very expensive to draw. So this is our scene here. Most of the forest is in view. Uh, we're getting high 20s, occasionally 30 FPS. Um, each of the, again, each of the, most of the 450,000 vertices are in view. Uh, those are all being converted into triangles, most of which are being drawn, unless they're facing away from the camera, or if they're uh, just off the screen. However, if I were to either back back up very far away, uh, those trees, those same amount of trees, are going to be turned into a smaller number of fragments, and you can see, as I back away, the frame rate is steadily going up. We're now 33, 36 uh, frames per second, high 30s now. Uh, the uh, Each of the trees are, are a very small section of the screen and they're getting smaller the farther back I get. And if I were to swing the camera around this way, uh, we are going to be looking at a almost completely black screen now because there are no lights or anything. Uh, we're getting almost 60 FPS, uh, despite the fact that we're still drawing nearly half a million vertices uh, because none of those vertices are getting converted into fragments except for the couple that are uh, uh, consisting of the player cylinder, which is, again, barely visible. And in this case, since we are now processing a half a million vertices and zero fragments, uh, in this particular case, it would actually be faster to, to run the lighting calculations inside the fragment shader. So that I can do a little bit of side-by-side -side testing, let me go back to Game Maker real quick and make a small edit. And that is going to be up here in the top of... Is the, um... Like, when I switch, when I switch display inputs on my monitor, uh, that's just appearing on my monitor, right? The thing that says, like, HDMI 1 active, HDMI 2 inactive, or whatever doesn't appear on the, uh, on the recording, right? Anyway, um, instead of saying current shader is going to equal shd underscore point underscore lights underscore vertex, I will say if if we're holding down the space bar, uh, we're going to be using the vertex shader ver version of the shader. Vertex shader version of the shader. I hate that sentence. And if we're not holding down the, the space bar, we will be instead using the fragment shader version. Okay. Otherwise, these are identical. They use the same number of lights. We're using uh, two spotlights, two point lights in each, um, where uh, the lighting calculations are almost the same. Um, I will say, I, I think I said this earlier, I do not remember, but I will say that this can produce slightly different results based on the way that the, um, the light information is interpolated over each, uh, over each triangle in the vertex shader versus in the fragment shader. So uh, right now we're using the fragment shader version of the shader. But if I was to hit the spacebar and use the vertex shader version instead, you can see that, um, especially on the uh, especially on the larger triangles uh, composing the floor and stuff, you can see a, li a little bit on the trees, although it's a uh, very slight. You can see that the 
that the light is slightly more round and smooth in the, in the fragment shader version. And that is generally why you would want to, to do this, to do these calculations in the fragment shader, because you often do get smoother, um, smoother results. Uh, whereas you can sort of see the individual, uh, the lights being interpolated over each of the individual triangles like this. It's not hugely noticeable, at least at least not like now. Um, it is slightly less noticeable when it comes to directional lights and slightly more noticeable when it comes to, to, to a cone lights or spotlights. Um, definitely, if you're going to use spotlights, do it in the fragment shader because it, it tends to look really bad in the vertex shader. Uh, anyway... Right now, if I uh, if I hold the spacebar, you use the vertex shader version, if, and if I were to run away, uh, you can see that the frame rate is going up. Uh, if I were to move the camera somewhere else, somewhere else, I said, uh, the frame rate is going to uh, to the high 50s, uh, mid 50s occasionally. But if I were to let go of the spacebar and use the fragment shader version instead, um, hey, we should be seeing, at least in some cases, the uh, the frame rate is actually going to be a little bit higher. Uh, you can see that we're pushing 60 most of the time out here. And that is because uh, we are now doing less math in the Vertex Shader, which is still running almost half a million times. Uh, we are instead doing the math in the Fragment Shader, which is running almost zero times. Uh, I'm not saying that this is something that you should definitely do to make your game run faster, but it's definitely something that you should probably keep in mind. I know that a lot of these 3D optimization videos that I've made tend to be at least a little bit situational and maybe not something that'll work for all games, but at least will be helpful for most games that most people are making. But uh, this one in particular, this a lot of this is very situational. And um, if your game is heavily dependent on lights, for example, uh, what I said about just cutting down the amount of lights just may or may not actually help at all. Because that may or may not actually be something that you can that you can practically do. I hope I don't end up disappointing too many people. Anyway, something else that you also occasionally see is um, for the same reasons, for very much the same reasons, that the uh, the fragment shader can run tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, or if you're making a game in like 4K or something, even millions of, of times per frame, um, is that if you can do an expensive calculation and pass it in as a uniform once, uh, that can also be slightly cheaper than, than doing an expensive calculation over and over in the fragment shader. Uh, while GPUs are very good at doing that sort of task over and over generally, like uh, trigonometric... Trigono I tried to say that word, trigonometry functions like sines or cosines or square roots or that sort of thing. If you can get away with simply calculating a cosine or a square root or something in GML and passing it to the shader as a uniform once, especially if you only have to do it once per frame for something like a lighting shader, uh, that, can, that can help. Little things like that can add up. Uh, it's common, in fact, when you're doing something like the spotlight, uh, if you're going to pass an angle of the of the cone into the shader to do the uh, cosine calculation in GML on the CPU side of things, instead of doing the cosine, instead of just passing the angle to the shader as a uniform and doing the cosine function in the shader, in the fragment shader over and over. Uh, that's one example. Again, food for thought. Okay, I think that is everything that I wanted to do in this video. So I would like to stress once again that I am running this video, I am running these tests on a Raspberry Pi. And as I keep saying, the Raspberry Pi is a $40 piece of computer equipment. This thing is considerably weaker than most things that most people are probably going to be trying to use to run games, even game maker games, which are tend to be a lot more, uh, a lot lower spec than something that might come out of Unity or Unreal Engine. And even something like a mid-tier laptop with integrated graphics can generally can generally beat the Raspberry Pi pretty badly when it comes to things like performance tests and benchmarks and stress tests and that sort of thing. So please don't come away from this thinking that you absolutely have to squeeze every last, every last CPU operation, every last uh, machine code operation out of, your, um, out of your code for performance reasons, because generally speaking, that's not the case. I'm just using the Raspberry Pi so that the, uh, so that the differences in, in different types of code become more pronounced. Hey. And additionally, uh, the, other, the other thing of note is that I am... I'll just I'll just bring the game back up on Windows now. I am trying to draw 450,000 vertices uh, in a vertex buffer here, and again, that is generally a lot more than most people running Game Maker games even even come close to attempting. I generally sort of more or less impose a put a self imposed limit on about 100,000 triangles or about 300,000 vertices uh, for my own games. That's just a, an arbitrary self imposed limit that I try not to exceed. And this scene alone, without any gameplay or anything, any monsters or anything like that, or any NPCs, contains 50% more than that. Although at the same time, if you're one of those people who likes to, uh, who likes to push the limits of systems like this, 
Uh, this uh, 450,000 vertices may just be getting started. I think the most vertices I've ever tried to crunch in a Game Maker game is something on the order of like 5 to 10 million before I, before I chickened out and stopped. Don't remember exactly. Anyway, I am done now. There's not much more that I want to say here. Uh, there is one more 3D optimization video that I want to do, and that is the umbrella concept of just not drawing stuff that you have to in the first place. All this that I've done so far is all well and good, but at the end of the day, it's hard to be just simply not running code that doesn't need to be run. So hopefully that video will be up in a week or two, and then we'll be able to close the book on 3D optimizations, at least for now. If there's anything else, any other subjects that come up, I'll, I'll revisit it. Anyway, the code for this will be in the video description. I will actually not commit these changes. Um, actually, I might commit this change to, to make the, the lights white instead of instead of red. But I will I will leave these as the original version of um of this project, so that you can mess around with it yourself without any modifications that I've made. Uh, other than that, I try to post about two game dev videos a week. One of these and one let's make a tower defense game, which is where a lot of this stuff gets put into practice. A couple weeks ago, I did actually spend some time optimizing that game to make it run better on on different um on different setups. So if you're interested in that or just a whole bunch of let's plays, feel free to subscribe and stick around. Otherwise, I have a Patreon, so if you want to contribute towards these videos being made, see your name in the credits, hear yourself shouted out at the end, and, and all that good stuff. Um, I will have a link to that in all the usual places. Otherwise, I hope you all found that useful, and I will see you all later. Special thanks to Connor, David Key, Edward Holt, Emily Coyo, Halo Factory, Posho, Sindra Larson, Tusk, and Zenith for supporting these videos. If you want to see your name in the credits or to hear yourself shouted out at the end, head on over to the Patreon page down in the video description to join the fun.